my mom always told me, if you can't say something nice, don't say something, nothing at all. So uh, I'll tell you that there's uh, less people to speak after me than you've heard before, so we're getting near the end. That's good. Uh, and more importantly, the amount of teamwork that's gone into this, uh, this effort. I hope you've noticed it so far, but from our end, it's uh, pretty amazing. I know Supervisor Ryan spoke of that in his speech as well. So uh, thank you for uh, indulging us in this uh, afternoon. Well, we've got lots of good things to talk about, right? We've got lots of rain, we've got some unpredictable events, we've got rock slides, we've got uh, all kinds of good stuff happening up here in the planning that we want to talk about. And as the fire district and help represent the, uh, the police agencies that I'm working with, some of them are up there on the top, we're here to respond when you need us. And uh, so we've been working quite a bit, having lots of meetings and, and planning and doing all kinds of things that we do in our business to prepare. It's kind of hard to prepare for all the stuff I just talked about because there's so many variables. So we're, we're looking to prepare the best we can and provide all the input that we can ahead of the monsoon starting. And, uh, and we'll be as best prepared as we possibly can, so I guarantee you that. However, it will be difficult because it's very unpredictable and very dynamic. And as we spoke of today, it's going to happen starting whenever the rain comes. And it could be when the snow on rain comes. Or, I'm sorry, when the rain on snow comes. Um, or it could be next year, and that's kind of the hard part. It's going to be a long going process for us to really keep on our toes. And so all the stuff we're talking about today needs to go in the long term memory bank for all of us because it's going to be a long term relationship. You're going to see a lot of us, I think, more and more in the future. So hopefully you like us. Technical search and rescue concerns. We're going to talk a little bit this, uh, this morning or afternoon rather about flooding, mudslides, rock slides, some of the health concerns that we have, coordination of evacuation efforts. Uh, Chief Driscoll talked a little bit about that. It's really critical you pay attention to those. Uh, the notification, the emergency warning systems that you hear in a little bit from uh, Robert Raleigh, and then the efforts of all the responders and participating agencies. So these challenges we have. You saw the maps a few minutes ago, the potential locations, the 50 homes that we just spoke of, all the different spots up and down the canyon. We're focused at the north end of the canyon, but we certainly haven't forgot about the south end of the canyon. Everything's going to come downstream. We haven't forgot about the city of Sedona as it leaves, you know, past Midgley Bridge there and gets into Sedona. So the concerns continue on. We cross between the Coconino County into the Yavapai County. So again, the complexities just continue on our end. So those locations are really important. So we're paying a lot of uh, very close attention to where those high, high red areas were in the, in the rock slide, in the mud slide area. We look at the rain and, and where the rain could come, on the hydrology maps and the, the uh, debris flows that are predicted in some of those areas. All those get calculated in and we try to make sure we prepare for those. That's very complex. Um, it presents a huge risk for our responders. So if you could imagine if, if there's a situation that occurs, that's unpredictable, it's dynamic. We have one rock slide occur. What's the likelihood of another rock slide? Um, I believe the uh, uh, meteorology talked about how quick it's going to occur. So how fast can we have our firefighters and our, uh, risk or our rescuers able to get in or get out of an area when it becomes unsafe in a matter of a minute or two? So, so that rule of engagement for us is really important and for you to understand how difficult it's going to be for us to really assess the safety of our ability to get into certain areas. I know we're used to calling 911 and getting a rapid response from your fire, from your police. In this case, it might be slightly different. Time of day in the middle of the night where we can't see what's up above us, that might preclude us from actually taking activities or emergency responses, rescue efforts. That's really hard to stand in front of this group here. A lot of you raise your hands, you live there. But you have to understand that this is what we're up against and the complexities and the dangers that are here. And we want to just be upfront and honest with you because it's so important for your safety and for ours. So that's that expectation of the public. That clear message is so important. We're talking about getting out, getting out quickly, being prepared. So having a plan, knowing what to do. Um, I go as far as much as saying maybe have your car backed into, the, into your driveway so you, you can actually just drive straight out. That's the kind of quickness we're talking about. Have those keys nearby, not looking for them. You don't have time for that. Packing a bag and getting ready to go. That's not the time that you have for this. It's going to be immediate. 
leave immediately, get to higher ground, and, and they'll speak to that. Uh, you'll see the flyers and things like that that you've already seen. And I talked about the time and length of those concerns that we have. It's, it's a very long and lingering situation, which makes it even more difficult for us to, to really process, us as rescuers and probably you as, as residents. So our flooding concerns. You know, when flooding is, is pending or present, we're going to rely on the, the weather service to provide that data, the rain gauges that are, are up there. Uh, but some of this is going to be trial and error. So we're going to have to try to just hopefully have it dialed in. Hopefully those maps are correct. And we know the IRA areas, but even if you're in one of those yellow areas with a 20% chance of having rock slides and things like that, what's your percentage again? 20%. If it happens, it's 100%. So, so you have to understand there's no areas that are really safe. Get to that higher ground where you can do so safely. That's going to be so important to understand where your house is in relation to where that higher ground may be. It may be completely different. It might be a different part of your, your parcel. It might be across the, the, the low water crossing in, in 89A. It might be some. Everyone's going to be different. So you need to take that personal inventory and see what you need and see what maybe your neighbor needs, if they need some help getting out. So, so think of those things. But, um, and understand that respect and, and the, the power of that water that's moving, the mud that can be flowing, it's just amazing. And so you have to pay attention to what that is and, and you know, talk about where can I go or where can't I go. And uh, just be careful, please. Um, low water crossings, I just mentioned that. Um, the fact is you may actually be blocked from getting out of your, your subdivision through the low water crossing. It's, it's, it's either open water over the top of it or debris is on it or it's washed away. And so being prepared to stay in your home with batteries and flashlights and a radio and those things, food to last you a couple days. Um, think of the fact that the responders trying to get to you if you're across one of the low water, water crossings. How are we gonna get to you to provide you the rescue? That in itself is a, is a lengthy process, let alone making the rescues and things like that on the other side. So that's flooding concerns. On to something more fun. Rock slides, highly unpredictable. Uh, you guys ever go hiking along that creek at all? You ever walk down there? You ever, you ever see those really big rocks that are down there? You ever wonder who carried them down there? <laughs> Gravity. So those rocks were sometime at one point up high and have now rolled down to get to the bottom there and rest comfortably at the bottom of the creek. That's the type of rocks we're worried about coming down as responders. We're worried about you as residents that might be in the way of one of those rocks. Usually when one of those rocks rolls down, they tend to actually hit more rocks, which creates more rocks coming down. So again, the dynamicness and the, and the dangers are all kind of probably pretty prevalent in everyone's eyes right now, right? So it's pretty hard to prepare for that. We've talked about what, what measures can we take. You know, there's not a lot. That false sense of security. We, we create a mitigation effort that maybe stops a rock or slows it down, and then another rock hits, and by the time the fourth or fifth rock might hit that barrier, it gives way, and now all four or five or six of those rocks come down. That becomes another challenge. So just think of these things as I'm talking. I don't have that many more bad things to talk about, but if I'm going to mudslides, they're not so bad. Well, maybe they are. That mud and the debris that's in there and those things coming down, uh, it, it, there's no way to control it. So we talked about the mitigation efforts, maybe being no mitigation, because if we put those Jersey barriers in, someone spoke of you know, Jersey barriers floating down uh, uh, mudslides in another city. Uh, like rubber duckies, I right, took your line, didn't I? Rob, uh, is that your line? Uh, you said that the other day. Um, it, that's pretty impressive to think about a 3,000 pound jersey barrier being picked up and floated by a mudslide. So if that's the kind of force and pressure that's there, how and where can the fire department, the search and rescue groups actually engage in until that's stopped? We have no way to, to control that. And if it does stop, is there another rainstorm coming? Is it going to happen again? And so we have to be careful where we engage in those type of things. So again, limited time to get to higher ground. And if that wasn't fun enough, we talk about health concerns. You know, uh, septic systems that people have in their homes. If they are going to uh, create a problem of human waste that's going to be now floating 
and in the area in which we're trying to do rescues or you're trying to, to, to get out of or whatever, can create some problems, just the human waste piece. If, you're, if you get cut, just the amount of just bacteria and things that could be in the area, so tetanus shots, things like that are pretty important. Um, may need to boil water at some point if there's a, a type of situation where that occurs. So just thinking of all these things as it relates to your health concerns are pretty important. So the expectations of the public, you have a personal responsibility to yourself and to everyone that's in your home or at your business to try to do the best you can do to avoid something bad happening. We're going to react and respond when, when it does happen, but we've told you today that we don't know if we can actually respond the way we normally would do because of the dynamic situation that presents itself above the incident, so to speak. We could have multiple incidents going on in different areas, and there's just only so many resources here that we can provide. So we'll be doing a, a triage of sorts that might require us to not be able to make it to your area for an extended period of time. Again, that's not something we're normally talking about here at the Sedona Fire District or the Search and Rescue or the Coping and Sheriff or the City of Sedona Police. We want to be there as quickly as we can, but this may dictate otherwise. So pay attention, watch for changing conditions, watch for all these things we're pushing out. There's a lot of information and you could probably get overload very easily, but we all have a stake in this and we want to make sure we're giving you everything that you need to be as safe and prepared as possible. And so it's really important. The responder preparedness, we've been meeting so much to try to prepare. We just did a training for people that might be working, first responder type people in the canyon. We've got the swift water rescue. We're going to be doing uh, some training in the canyon on July 1st. Um, we're, we're, we're creating plans and we're doing all kinds of things to create uh, relationships with people that we might need to call upon to, to respond to your area. And so we're doing all these things. And as I mentioned at the start of my presentation, we have lots of public agencies working together. It's become a real nice uh, assurance that we've got a great team here to provide the best service to you in the best possible way we can. We hope we don't have to, but the reality is, is this is going to happen. It's going to be here. It's going to be here by the weather guy after July 7, okay? But it's going to be here actually for maybe more than a year. And that's, again, something you have to think about. We can never let our guard down. So we're here for you. Please be prepared, be prepared for yourself. Pay attention to the notifications and the warnings. We'll be doing uh, some information uh, coming up here on, on some other up, upcoming warnings and some practice runs and signage and all that stuff. And so please pay attention to that. I'll end with have a plan, know the plan, practice the plan, be prepared. Thank you. Are we ready for a little good news after that? The good news is I only have three slides. And there's one. Okay, uh, real quick on here. One of the things we want to try to make sure is when the weather service is getting to the point where they're looking at issuing a flash flood warning, that they have all the tools that they need and the data available to, to get that done. So, where is the laser on here? The middle of it, thank you. So, real quick, what you're looking at here, the, it's, it's kind of tough to see this map, but all of these blue little uh, balloons here all represent existing gauges that are up uh, in uh, Oak Creek Canyon, West Fork area. And these are all gauges that are maintained and have been put in place by the Yavapai County Flood Control District. Obviously, Yavapai County has a vested interest in knowing what's going on with this water when it gets down to here in Sedona and Yavapai County. Uh, we're also looking at installing uh, three, and that possibly, hopefully Dan Sherry can talk a little bit about this where they're at on that, installing three additional gauges in there in some of these critical uh, watershed areas so the Weather Service has even better data uh, when they're like, getting to the point for issuing those flash flood warnings. <coughs> Excuse me. So. What are our concerns for getting the flash flood warnings out to you, the, in, in the general public? Well, one thing we know is there's little to no cell phone service down in the canyon. 
So that right off the bat limits uh, some, some of the power of our code red notification system. <clears throat> I think probably most of you at this point, since I saw a lot of hands in the canyon, have already heard or received a code red notification. So you know that comes to your cell phone, your landline, it'll email you, it'll text you, or it'll use the smartphone app. But without that uh, cell service or, or data service in the canyon, that pretty much limits <laughs> those notifications from your landline. Uh, we know we get a large number of visitors in the canyon, so they aren't going to be signed up for Code Red. And we know we're going to have a very short notice from when you get the warning to when you may be seeing flood alarms. So what are some of the method methods we can use? Well, as I said, Code Red. And then we know that the system works. We're very confident in the system, and we know what its capabilities are. And I hope every single person in this room is signed up, and if you're not, we have computers out in the lobby, so don't leave until we do get you signed up. We have the emergency alert system in place, which is uh, administered in Pocatino County by the National Weather Service. So those are the tones and the emergency messages you get over your TV or over your radio. But you have to be listening to your, t to your radio or watching your TV to get those messages. We know we have weather radio, and there is an intermittent coverage of weather radio throughout the canyon. And we have other methods, portable message boards, like we're showing up there, um, a possibility of using a portable radio station down in the canyon, uh, the education that we're giving you all right now. But one other big uh, capability uh, that we have in Oak Creek Canyon that, that is pretty unique to all of Coconino County is the existence of our siren system in there. We have nine sirens uh, up and down uh, at various locations in the county, or in the canyon. Okay, the problem with the siren system is it has only been used intermittently over the past you know, several years, maybe close to a decade at this point. We are going to change that, and the siren system is now going to be fully implemented to advise you of the issuance of a flash flood warning. One of the first things we're going to do to start this is we're going to implement a full system test of the siren system one week from today, June the 26th, uh, which is Thursday at 2 p.m. We're going to activate every siren in the system. We're also testing the entire warning process from the weather service going through their process on how they issue a warning to how the Sedona Fire District is notified to activate the sirens to CAF radio going live on air, uh, announcing um, that the, the sirens are going off and why they are. And we are also going to station uh, over 20 community emergency response team volunteers throughout the canyon at every siren site to, to be absolutely certain that they're functioning properly and to determine how well they can be heard in various locations. We would like you, during the siren test, to test yourselves at the same time. This is an excellent time for you to practice getting to your safe location on your property or if you're going to evacuate, whatever you determine is best for yourself and your location. And we would also like you to practice how you're going to get that additional information. When you hear the siren, what do you do next? Well, first you get to your safe area, and then how are you going to get that additional information? Are you going to get it off television? Are you going to get it off weather radio? Are you going to tune to 92.9? and get the additional information there. We want you to practice this. And finally, you've heard that we are now in a, in a new situation here in the canyon. What were once storms that may happen over the monsoon season that were never really a concern are now most definitely a concern. So we're asking you to prepare yourselves to hear these sirens going on <laughs> much more frequently than you're used to in the past. I, I talked to Brian Klamowski before this meeting, and, and he said last year alone there were 10, uh, 10 storms that formed up and, and rained in, in Oak Creek Canyon that last year did not trigger a, a flash flood warning, but this year in these circumstances and these conditions would trigger a flash flood warning. So these are all going to be parts of the puzzle, parts of the system that are going to be utilized to let you know that something dangerous is about to happen. We're going to use Code Red, we're going to use the emergency alert system, we're going to use weather radio, we're going to use the sirens, and they will all be happening simultaneously in the hopes that everybody will get that message. 
again, the importance for all of you now is to determine what is the best way you think you're going to receive that notification and then learn now what you need to do to make sure that you're ready the next time your phone rings or that siren goes off. <coughs> and with that, we're going to turn it over to Nicole Brandon, Red Rock District Ranger for the Coconino National Forest. Yes, I am Nicole Branton, and I think I picked the wrong year to become the District Ranger for the Red Rock Ranger District. Um, I'm going to try to keep this pretty short because I don't know about you guys, I'm a little, a little tired of sitting up here, but um, um, I have this list of things I wanted to say to you guys, but um, I think a better way to approach this is to summarize what I've heard some of my colleagues say here in the last few minutes. So um, let's hear, let's see, tonight we've heard the National Weather Service say uh, that there will be life-threatening weather this summer, that you'll have minutes to respond. We've heard our bear team say, this water knows where, where to go, which is in the stream channel. Uh, we've heard our emergency responders say that um, one of the big challenges they face is how they're going to warn visitors, um, and, and that they may not be able to get to you. And I think you've heard uh, several people here tonight say there's really nothing we can do about some of these things. Um, so what that kind of adds up to for, for us in the Forest Service is um, that there is something that we can do. And that is limit the number of people that are in the path of these floods and, and the things that are coming. So, um, <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, so, one of the things that we're going to do with the Forest Service is that we are going to maintain our current fire closure. Now, this is the slide fire perimeter. This is basically what was involved directly in the fire. West of 89A from Slide Rock State Park to the switchbacks. Uh, this includes the recreation sites, the developed recreation sites, as well as the forest itself. And uh, this is really about uh, protecting the public from hazards associated with the fire itself. That rock fall, that dry rabble, um, those rocks hitting other rocks and becoming projectiles that you've heard us talk about. Uh, also debris flow and the bare implementation itself. The, the things like uh, the um, like placement of straw bales with helicopters and things like that. Whoops. Maybe a way to reveal. Uh, the second thing we'll be doing is um, a second closure. And this will be at the onset of the monsoon. This will be closure of all Forest Service system lands within Oak Creek Canyon, from Sedona to the switchbacks. So that'll be up to the rim, both on the east and west side. Um, this is due to the potential for, that you've heard about tonight, the potential for flooding, debris torrents, and also the evacuation issues that you've heard uh, the fire department and the county sheriff talk about. Um, and one of the reasons is that uh, people disperse throughout the creek when they go to our recreation sites. One of the things I've learned in my whatever it's been, 10 or 11 months now, of being district ranger here is that people don't necessarily um, do what I say. So although I might ask them to stay in our developed rec sites, um, what people in fact do is get in those sites and disperse up and down the canyon uh, in, in the water, kind of trying to get away from concentrations of other people. Um, and I think when, when you hear our um, first responders talking about the challenges they face, you can see why this is a problem for them, um, is, is trying to track down where people are when you have minutes to respond to a life-threatening flood. So this area will include sites that are currently, as of today, open, like Midgley Bridge, Grasshopper Point Picnic Area, the Indian Gardens Visitor Center, um, Encinoso Picnic Area, Manzanita Campground. It will also include trails in general, the general um, national forest lands within the closure area. And those pullouts along 89A where people park and drop down into the creek um, for dispersed recreation. So the timing on this, here's the tricky part, is um, th this is really about those downstream effects that are associated with precipitation. Um, and uh, so we, we need to find a way to predict when those first storms are going to happen. Because for this to be successful, we need to do this closure before it starts raining. So expect that this will happen on a sunny day. Um, we're going to do our best to give people the 4th of July weekend. Um, so I'll say that at, at the very latest, we'll close on July 7th. But we'll be working with the National Weather Service to track the development of those storms um, to, uh, to determine when the best time is to close those sites. And it may be before the 4th. 
Uh, so be prepared for those sites to, uh, to close at any time. Um, so these closures will remain in effect, in effect until at least the end of this monsoon season. We'll see what happens as this stuff comes downhill and um, uh, what it looks like when we reach the end of the monsoon season. Again, we'll work with the National Weather Service to figure out what that means. Um, and we'll do another assessment at that point and determine if it makes sense to open some of these sites or all of these sites. Um, but it's just there's, there's uh, too much uncertainty at this point to know what that's going to look like. Um, so this will only affect national forest system lands, private land, including privately owned businesses, resorts, restaurants, etc. Um, will be unaffected by this. Uh, they can remain open if the, if the owners choose to do so. So there, there will still be, I imagine, opportunities for people to recreate there on private land. Um, Slide Rock State Park uh, may choose to remain open. The portion of Slide Rock State Park that is national forest system land will be included in this closure, though. So, I, and I just want to say that, um, you know, this, uh, we, we've laid this all out for you today, and it, it, it does seem like kind of a no-brainer, as, as you've heard person after person talk about the dangers in here. But I do want to say that um, this was a complicated decision. Um, it's not something that, that Scott and I take lightly. Um, we, we really considered every angle of this and, and discussed it for a long time. And we recognize that, that this will have an impact to um, visitors in the canyon, uh, to the people who come to this area to, to recreate and come here as tourists, and also to those businesses in the canyon and to outfitters and guides that operate on national forest system lands there. Um, however, we, we really feel as public servants that we have to put public health and safety first, and that's what we're doing with this decision. Um, I will be working with the Sedona Chamber of Commerce, however, and, and other businesses in the area to redirect people to the many other beautiful places that we have here in the Red Rock Ranger District, and um, to remind people that this is really a pretty small closure when you consider the, the whole footprint of the National Forest. So there's, you know, five, over 500,000 other acres people can be recreating on in the Red Rock District, and we'll be working with the community to, to point, redirect people to those areas. So I will be uh, in the lobby if you want any information on the specific areas that are closed, but I'm going to try to keep it brief with you guys. So thank you. Next is Tim Ernster, Sedona City Manager, to discuss City of Sedona preparedness activities. Thank you, Rob. Uh, just to let you know that the, the city staff, Police Chief Ray Coda, Andy Dickey, our city engineer, and others have been working very closely with Coconino County, uh, the Forest Service, Nicole, and, and also Chief Chris Kazian through this whole process. Uh, and there are some things that, that we will be doing over the next few weeks. Uh, in order to possibly help our, our residents prepare in case we have flooding events in Sedona. And the first thing that happened uh, this week was that we did send letters out to property owners uh, adjacent to Oak Creek in Sedona, uh, just within the last couple of days. And in the letter, we're reminding the residents that they need to remove debris that might serve as blockages or obstacles to the flow of water. Uh, through Oak Creek if we have higher levels of flow. Also, some of those residents did receive a consent form, and we are asking those residents to uh, give city staff permission to come onto their property, to inspect their property, uh, to determine if there are uh, blockages in the drainages or, or, or possibly uh, something in the way of the flow, and to provide the, the homeowners uh, some advice on how they might want to remove that out of the way. Uh, again, we want to, the purpose for this is to identify debris, uh, vegetation, and other impediments that could potentially cause flooding problems for you and your neighbors. Also, uh, tomorrow and, and Saturday, Friday uh, and, and Saturday, we are having a volunteer sandbag day, and we're asking for volunteers to help us out. Uh, we're going to have the, the sandbag day at the uh, City's maintenance yard located at 2070 Contractors Road. Uh, it'll be from 7 o'clock in the morning till 11 o'clock. Uh, and uh, if you show up, we'll provide you the necessary equipment that you need to help us go through that process. We're hoping to fill 4,000 sandbags this weekend. Uh, very possibly, depending on the intensity of the storms uh, during the monsoon season, we might have some, some other volunteer days uh, further down the road in the summer. So if you can help us out, we would really appreciate it. Uh, we suggest that you come prepared. Uh, with some sturdy shoes, 
uh, if you do have work gloves, bring those. We will have some work gloves at the site, and we uh, also will have water uh, and other supplies available. Uh, the fire department did donate some water for us for that event. So we encourage you to come if you can make it. We would really appreciate it. The following weekend, we're having a three-day, uh, uh, oh, excuse me, the, the, we have actually, oops, I'm getting ahead of myself. We have actually five different uh, locations where residents can pick up sandbags. Uh, and we, we did have three. We have added two uh, recently. And all this information will be available at the table out in the, in the lobby. We will have a table staff there with handouts for this information. So uh, we, we encourage you to stop by our table. And we, we can give you some information on picking up sandbags and also how to fill those sandbags and, and how to place them on your property. We do have a yard clean event planned for the weekend of June 27th, 28th, and 29th. And at our maintenance yard, uh, we will have uh, large dumpsters available so that if residents want to bring their combustible materials by, we will dispose of those for you. Uh, anything that you might have that, that might cause, again, blockages in the, drain, in the drainages or possibly uh, with the potential for fire, we encourage you to bring it. Uh, to our maintenance yard, and we have to dispose of that for you. We are, again, uh, encouraging you to sign up for Code Red in your respective county, whether it be Coconino County or Yavapai County. We do have a card out in the lobby on our table, uh, encouraging you, providing the information to do that. We also have our own Citizens Connect, which is similar to Code Red, which will provide you the opportunity not only to communicate with City Hall, but in, in the event of an emergency, we can communicate with you. So we encourage you to sign up for Citizens Connect, especially because if we have an event in Sedona that doesn't necessarily affect either Yavapai or Coconino County, then we would want to be able to, to, to communicate with you. Finally, we have all this information on our <laughs> Facebook page, our Twitter. Uh, you, you'll be able to find us on YouTube with additional information uh, and also on our website. So we encourage you to take advantage of those Source of, sources of information. Again, we do have a table in the lobby. Please stop by and we'll be happy to give you some handouts. We have a map of the locations of the uh, where you can pick up your sandbags uh, beginning on the 23rd of this month. Thank you very much. And next is Dan Cherry, Yavapai County Flood Control District Director to talk about Yavapai County Emergency Preparedness. Thank you. Uh, Appreciate everybody sticking around. I know this is taking a while. Uh, we have a lot of information to share, and I apologize for the length. I would like to uh, thank everybody here. This has been an amazing team to be a part of. Uh, they are really working with everybody out there who lives here in the canyon and downstream of that with your best interest in mind. I understand you getting some bad news here, and uh, I, uh, I just want you all to know how Hard. All of these people are working for you. Uh, you should be very proud of them. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to be very, very brief here. Uh, as uh, Rob said, I'm Dan Cherry with the Yavapai County. I just want to talk very briefly uh, about Oak Creek and Yavapai County. Water doesn't really recognize political boundaries. It just keeps on going. Everything in Coconino County in this watershed ends up in Yavapai County. So. We are obviously concerned about that. Uh, I will say that the, uh, the hot issues of the mudslides, landslides, rock falls, uh, and whatnot are uh, strictly a Coconino County uh, concern. Those are very, very important. I want everybody to take that away from this. By the time of water and mud and whatnot gets to Yavapai County, we're dealing more with riverine type flooding uh, in a classic flooding sense. We're going to have uh, debris, we're going to have sediment, we're going to have ash in the water, it's going to be dirty, it's going to be ugly. Uh, there's a chance for higher runoff potential, but by the time it gets to Yavapai County, and for those of you that may be Yavapai County residents, uh, our concerns are lesser. Uh, so please keep that in mind. Um, so what to do? Uh, as Supervisor Matt Ryan said at the beginning, if you have a chance to get flood insurance, you should get flood insurance. Everybody here that has any potential for flooding should be getting out there and getting a flood insurance policy if you think you're going to be affected by this. I cannot stress that enough. 
We deal with this every day in our own jobs. We tell people, get flood insurance if you are in a high hazard zone. Well, the hazard zones associated with this are extremely high hazard zones. So please, if you have the opportunity to get flood insurance, please do so. You can go to your standard insurance agent. If they can't help you with that, they will direct you to somebody who can. Uh, secondly, review your property. If you are down along Oak Creek or you are in a, uh, an area that may receive increased water and you have debris or materials that can be carried downstream, such as plug up a culvert or a bridge or uh, cause problems for other people, please remove that. Get it out of the way so that water can't carry that down. Uh, sandbags, as Tim with the city uh, <coughs> mentioned, uh, there are numerous <coughs> locations for sandbags around Sedona. Uh, and Dustin had mentioned that there's going to be some up, staged up in Oak Creek Canyon. They can be helpful. <coughs> they can't stop everything. I want everybody to understand that too is you can't just put a wall of sandbags and expect it's going to stop the kind of events that are, have the potential of occurring here. So uh, use them smartly, use them to help direct things as far as runoff goes. Sometimes you may be just adding to the problem though if you're putting them across something that is too large for them to help with. So keep that in mind. I'm trying to make these available for people to use, but they're not appropriate for all situations. Uh, educate yourselves. Floodsmart.gov is a uh, fabulous resource that we direct people to every day. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of, reason, of information there that if you take the time to get on that website and look up uh, uh, flooding risks that's associated with wildfires, you can get good information there. There's also a lot of information on Floodsmart about flood insurance, so take the time to look at that if you're concerned about it. And lastly, as everybody else here has said, be aware of what's going on. Uh, keep in tune. <coughs> if flooding occurs, go to high ground. Do not drive across flooded roads, okay? If it's a low water crossing and it's got water going across it and you can't see what's underneath that water, it could be washed out. You don't want to put yourself in a situation where you become part of the problem out there. It's better to stay put if you're in a good spot. A little bit of contact information here. Uh, Rob mentioned that uh, that uh, we've got several gauges in the upper watershed of Oak Creek and West Fork. Uh, if you go to our website, ycflood.com, there's a link on there to get to our uh, flood warning network mapping and gauges. So if you'd like to follow along, that's more or less from the time data. This is something the Weather Service will sometimes use to do get some spot checks. Uh, while they're following storm patterns in the area. So you two can get to that. Uh, other than that, uh, I'd like to wrap this up. So thank you, everybody. We appreciate being here. Uh, once again, on behalf of everybody here, we want to thank you all for coming out. Uh, Rob will uh, give a final conclusion. Uh, but uh, just to reiterate, uh, it's life, health, and safety that we're looking at. Uh, we depend upon you uh, as well. Obviously, uh, you're a part of your community. There are many people that are not here uh, that we need help uh, getting in contact with. Uh, please uh, help us in that way. If you have a chance and would like to get involved, we have the CERP training, and you have multiple uh, agencies here that will try as best we can uh, to help you through this event. There's a short-term piece and there's a long-term piece uh, that will change with time. So please keep that in mind, keep working with us, uh, and we'll uh, keep trying to bring appropriate support to you. Uh, Rob? All right, so that does conclude our program, our presentation for you tonight. Um, we saw some hands come up throughout the presentation. We will take all questions uh, out in the lobby. We are all here until you guys are done and have had every single one of your questions answered. We realize a lot of information to process here, so we'll be there for you to, uh, to answer all of those questions. And uh, the other thing is,
we're asking, based on how we have things set up, that everybody exit the auditorium over here to my left, your right. And with that, thank you very much for uh, your participation and your engagement, and we really look forward to working with you.